Hello everyone, today is February 14th, 2016, and you're looking at episode 31 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as always are Laurel Black. Hi. Megan Arns. Hello. And Ben Charles. Hi everybody. So with us today we have one of percussion's favorite composers. Some of his best known percussion works include Straight Jacket, Go Dog Go, Gone Dog Gone, Catfish, The Ferny Ho Remix, Echolalia, and Aphasia, which I know is not a percussion piece, but it seems to always be performed by percussionists. I've actually never seen anyone else do it. Uh, his TED Talk is super well known. It's called The Mad Scientist of Music, and today, I checked earlier, it's just shy of one million views. Wow. And I would just like to say, I feel like Mark Applebaum is one of our best communicators of new music. I feel like Mark does for new music what Neil deGrasse Tyson does for science. Like these, <laughs> <laughs> all these lectures and your TED talk are just really, really wonderful presentations and introductions to new music, especially for anyone who's coming across it for the first time. So it's really great to have Associate Professor of Composition and Theory at Stanford University, Dr. Mark Applebaum. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I was going to ask you right off the bat, what is, um, have you been on kind of a long lecture circuit? I, I feel like every time I, I look you up on YouTube, I seem to find new, new presentations, a new talk from Stanford, or um, a, a, new, a new jazz improvisation lecture or something. Has that kind of um, gotten busier and busier for you over the recent times? You know, I don't think of it as a lecture circuit, and I, um, it's not conceived as such. And... Um, but, but what I do find is that um, people invite me, or maybe more accurately, they tolerate me, um, and, and I start speaking somewhere, and then sometimes somebody has one of these video cameras, and then it ends up on the web. So um, it's not as deliberate and um, as sensible as a, as a um, you know, like a tour or something like that. Um, but rather, I just have like ideas that, um, and I entertain myself, and sometimes there's an audience. Um, <laughs> so that's maybe a more accurate description of what happens. But I, yeah. you know, but I mean, really, I mean, <clears throat> today and this forum is a case in point. You guys have been sort of like bamboozled into listening to me. Um, and at some point, <laughs> at some point, you'll stop, presumably. But for the moment, you're still sort of polite and you're here. And, and you seem to be wanting to do the same thing that other people do, which is then you're going to share this with some sort of audience. And then, as you mentioned, you know, some people watch it. And so, like, like my mom has been clicking on my TED Talk a million times. Um, so that's how that works. I didn't mean to undermine the very meaningful and significant, you know, um, forum that this is and as an enterprise. I didn't mean to <laughs> insult that in any way. Um, oh. But it is kind of like a little bit, I have to say, it is kind of like that Groucho Marx thing, which is my respect for you has diminished significantly ever since you expressed an interest in me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which movie is that from? I can't remember. Well, it's just, I don't remember. It's just like, yeah, that's that adage. Uh, he he wouldn't yeah. want to be in any, a member of any club that would have him or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Hey, well, um, speaking of your pieces, we have a, uh, a phagist here with us. Um, ben has a great recording of aphasia, and I was hoping, Ben, I would just love to hear you tell Mark a little bit about your experience learning the piece and what you think of it, and it would just be great to hear you guys talk a little. Yeah, sure. So, well, my introduction to Mark was, I think, like a lot of people, was the TED Talk. Um, and, uh, yeah, he performs a little snippet of aphasia in that, um, and that piece in particular just kind of stuck in my head like, wow, I could, I could probably do that sometime. Um, and eventually I got in touch with Mark and he sent me the materials for it. And, um, it was literally, I never really intended on performing it. I just kind of learned it for fun in my, you know, in my room at home, um, just for something to do in my spare time, more or less. Um, and I remember the first time I ever performed it for anyone, they were like, wow, that's, you know, really something. Um, so at that point, I decided, well, maybe, you know, maybe this is something I should do. So I kind of worked on it some more and polished it up um, and performed it on one of my doctoral recitals at University of Miami. Um, and then the recording I made was actually, uh, again, just kind of done for fun. Um, it was, I remember it was Black Friday one year, and I didn't participate in the 
Black Friday festivities, so to speak. Um, so I just decided I was going to do like 10 or 12 takes of aphasia with the camera at different angles um, and then spliced them all together. And it, it looks like it's um, one single take done with like multiple cameras, but it's really just one camera and the audio is synced up. So it's, you know, synchronized with itself every single time. Um, and so I just kind of, I think I recorded it and edited the whole thing all in one day and uploaded it again, just, just for fun. Um, so yeah, that was my experience with the piece. It's, it was, it's a lot of fun and I, I thought it would just take me years to kind of learn it. Um, and I, I think I learned it in about three weeks. Um, so yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Ben. And thank you for playing, playing aphasia. I'm grateful to you and to, um, I mean, you complete me. So, um, I, and I, and I say that to you specifically, and then of course to, um, percussionists in general. Percussionists, I'm going to digress here and mention that percussionists are the best. Um, there are, uh, I like flutists, uh, I like cellists, um, pianists are okay. They're all good. I need them all, but percussionists are definitely the best. I just want to go on record here. Oh, um, yeah, good. So, which one is your wife? Does your wife play? <laughs> Actually, even better than percussionists are non-musicians. That's awesome. <laughs> and she's she's happily in that category, um, or at least it being in a relationship. For me, um, I don't know how you guys manage. For those of you who are um, two two musician, two artist personality households, but um, my. Um, my ego and r runaway narcissism is like, you know, it just crowds the whole space. So there's only sufficient um, uh, area for that in our household. But um, but I really like percussionists uh, because um, there's this kind of can-do attitude. There's this really intrepid experimental sense that really uh, connects well with my musical and artistic outlook. Percussionists, I find, are looking for challenges they're, of course, by definition, and I'm not talking about those crazy um, marimba divas or the orchestral timpanists, who are both of whom I think are a discredit to the whole world of percussion and what I think of as being important about percussion, um, which is this this ethos of like doing multiple things and doing them sequentially and doing them simultaneously, and I love that. And so it's not a surprise that percussionists are the ones who have championed aphasia, which as um, as you pointed out, Casey, doesn't have to be performed, or Ben, doesn't have to be performed by a, um, a percussionist per se. And I think, there, uh, I think but, there actually is a recording of an oboist doing it on YouTube now. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's Alison Lowell, who actually performed aphasia on her DMA recital at the University of Maryland, her DMA oboe recital, which I really, <laughs> which amuses me to no end. So that's actually really, an act of gutsy sort of like counterculture or something, um, at least in the oboe world. But I mean, but the thing is, there's like, you know, um, I find that there's a lot of players, m instrumentalists who say, um, you know, this is what I do, write me something like that. And percussionists tend to say, this is what I, this is what I do, please make me do something different. And so that's something that I find really admirable and I like quite a bit. So to date, to my knowledge, there's been over something like 250 performances of aphasia by m more than, I think, 60 different players in at least 18 countries, which is pretty amazing for a piece that I thought was impossible, uh, or I knew wasn't impossible, I, I was told was impossible. Um, and so that the, the origin of the performance praxis, praxis was that I then learned it as a challenge. And then I put up my own video um, and YouTube. Ben, that amazes me that you learned it in like three weeks. It took me three months, three or four months to learn it. And I had composed, I composed the piece. So I was sort of intimate and I knew what was going on. Um, it wasn't very good after three weeks to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, actually, one thing you said reminded me uh, of how many, you know, different performances it's had. Um, Morris Paltzer told me a story about, he was in, I can't remember what country it was in, in South America, and he performed aphasia um, and like the the mayor of the town or whatever was was so impressed that first of all on the front page of the newspaper was a picture of Morris Palter performing aphasia the next day, and also uh, the mayor or governor or whatever it was uh, had Morris over to his house to perform the piece again like the next day. <laughs> that's awesome! Wow, that's cool. 
Yeah, you know, there's been, uh, I know there's a uh, uh, Robin Eggers is a percussionist um, who is uh, doing his master's thesis at the Rotterdam Conservatory, and aphasia was a central part of his master's thesis. Um, there's a group, uh, Parlor Tapes Plus in Chicago, who are very interesting, and they set out to um, get 100 percussionists together, 100 players together, I should say, in Grant Park to perform aphasia simultaneously. They got six, but that's like... That's five more than I normally get, and six more than I feel like I'm entitled to. Anyway, the point is, it's a miracle that people actually are interested in my music, and, and so I say thank you again to Ben and all of you for your interest. Well, I have a question actually as a follow-up to that, because you're talking about you know, having a large working relationship with percussionists, and if I'm not mistaken, you've worked with Steve Schick a fair amount? That's right. Could you I would tell say... us about that relationship? Yeah, I, I'd say that Steve Schick and, and Terry Longshore are the two percussionists with whom I've um, worked the most, and they've both commissioned several pieces from me, and they've championed my music over the years, and um, they're both very important to me. Steve, um, Steve was, uh, so when I did my PhD at the University of California, San Diego, Steve joined the faculty shortly after I, I was already a student there, and I was so taken by him in in so many respects. I mean, for most percussionists, you'd think that that would be because of his extraordinary performance acumen and his interpretive abilities. And that certainly um, looms large to me, and that's, those are some of the qualities that attract me as anyone to Steve. But Steve is a whole individual and, uh, and just an amazing person and a great friend, and I've learned so much from him. I've modeled my, my classroom teaching uh, on 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 him as a as as a, as a as a public speaker, I've I've been influenced by him in terms of his sensitivity in diplomatic uh, matters and in things that have to do with relationships uh, in the whether professional or personal. There, there's so many things that I admire about him, and so um, it was great that I was able to um, invite him and that he accepted my invitation to be part of my doctor my doctoral committee. Although my PhD is not in as a performer, it's as a composer. And so having um, a musician, a performer's perspective on, on my committee was extremely useful. And of course, having Steve's um, perspective was great. There's also something, in, I mean, Steve is, I mean, you know, this is like an outsized musical persona of the 20th and 21st century. Um, I guess I don't, I don't have to say more about Steve because I'm preaching to the choir if, the, if you have like percussion, you know, listeners. Um, but like he's also amazingly modest in very funny ways. Like I remember, this is something that I try to emulate from Steve. He once came to, he was coming to Stanford to play a concert. And it was the first time that I had invited him to Stanford. And I think that's the concert where he premiered um, uh, Fanny Ho Remix. Um, and I was nervous. I said, Steve, you know, we don't have like all of the fancy percussion instruments that you are accustomed to at UCSD. I'm a little, you know, I'm worried that you're not, you're going to find them substandard. And he looked at me super seriously in a scary way. And he said, Mark, I play exclusively what's available. <laughs> and I just thought like, Wow, you know, like this is this is really cool. Like somebody at the top of their game, they don't need to be. They're not like a diva. They don't. They just they make music with whatever they find. And so, anyway, that's something that I deeply admire about Steve. Hey, you know, I I would love to ask you, Mark, um, for for a lot of the composers out there. How how did you how did you become what you are today? I mean, I know your education and your hard work. What did, was there a time you had, say, a, a big break, as they call it, or, you know, how did you, how did you really composition turned into a career for you? Probably that would be um, the Taco Bell plan. So, when when I was an undergraduate, and I was okay, so, man, I, you know, you probably like already like now at this point a little bit upset and rethinking your decision to invite me to be part of this program because I can be <laughs> rather loquacious and prolix and, and, and verbose. So, um, but I realized that for background here, I have to explain that I went to a liberal arts college, Carleton College in Minnesota. 
And I went there because I wanted to have a broad liberal arts education. I was a musician in high school. I was starting to compose a few things, but I mostly identified myself as like a, a perf you know, a kind of a, a pianist, a classical and, and, and rock sort of keyboardist. Um, but I knew I wanted to take music classes. Um, and so I took music theory, some music theory and music history at Carleton College, but I had no interest in being a music major. And the reason for that is because I already knew a little bit about music and my whole devotion was to like this liberal arts panorama, the diversity of different disciplines. And I wanted to take courses. There wasn't a single department that didn't interest me. And what happened is at the time that I had to declare a major, which was my sophomore year, I looked around and I noticed that there were some of my classmates who were double majors. And I thought that was very impressive and very ambitious. And so I thought about being a double major, but then I did the math and I realized that that would give me depth in two areas, which is one more than one, but at the cost of enormous electoral breadth. I realized that by having depth in two areas, I would use up all of these spaces, all these slots, all these times that I could be taking one or two courses in a whole, you know, a whole array of disciplinary areas. And so then I thought, well, wait a second, on that, with that logic, which is essentially tells me that, um, you know, the major, in a sense, is the enemy of the broad liberal arts education. On that same basis, I sort of thought, well, wait a second, I only need two more classes in music to finish the music major. So I became a music major in order to do more not music. Huh. And to this day, music really bores me and is super tedious and is, I mean, it's kind of an occupational hazard, I guess. I don't, for me at least, not for many people, fortunately, but I don't like music. I love music, I hate music, I'm interested in music. I think it's important. Uh, I love, I like that other people like music, that people enjoy it, but I don't experience it that way anymore. That's a whole, I'm sorry, that's, that's maybe a little too tempting, but I'm gonna push that aside. But the, the point is that I'm interested in being a composer today because it's a way of leveraging experience in not composition, in not music. So a piece like aphasia allows me to get to be a choreographer for a moment even though I don't have any experience or any training in choreography. When I make these pieces using wristwatches where the players follow the second hands as they pass over various glyphs, that's a no musical notation, but it's because it's on a wristwatch. I'm, I'm kind of like a, a product designer in a sense of some sort and, and so forth. And, and, um, and so like a lot of these opportunities um, uh, that I see, like commissions, are, are chances of working in extra musical space in some ways because uh, for some purposes of like self-loathing or I don't know, different other kinds of psychological um, um, problems, that we'll just call them for challenges, we'll say. Um, I, I'm just trying to escape myself and escape this, you know, I'm just sort of tired of, I'm really fatigued with myself, so I'm looking for sort of other avenues of expression. So that's background to the Taco Bell plan, which is I realized that I just wanted to make art and there was there was there was a real sense that um well like um I may forego a lot of comforts and luxuries in life if I commit myself to doing this. I mean, the life of the artist did not seem like a safe one. So if I had other friends who were becoming like investment bankers or lawyers or doctors or things like that, that sounded like, you know, the kinds of things that like your parents are proud to tell other parents at like a cocktail party that their son or daughter is doing, as opposed to like, he's devoted himself to writing uncompromising and unmarketable experimental music. Often music, <laughs> often music increasingly that makes no sound. You know, my okay. dad and I have a, an understanding with my recitals. He, in fact, just on the phone the other day, he was asking about an upcoming performance I have, and he said, are you going to play anything I like? <laughs> it's just like we just we just know we just we just and it's perfectly peaceful it's like well there's that's the great. stuff he likes and then there's like all that stuff that he just doesn't like and my sister that's calls great. you know ought you know <laughs> you guys have come to an understanding I had a, a roommate in grad school who was a structural engineer and his father had two criteria by which music could be good could be deemed good either he had to be able to whistle the melody after the after the performance or and I love this it should sound like a train. Huh. And my roommate okay. realized that there was some possibility that I could fulfill the latter. <laughs> like I might be able to make some music that sounds like a train. Sure. Like a, 
Anyway, but the Taco Bell plan was like the realization that, um, okay, I've devoted my life to, um, I want to devote my life to this weird thing. And, I, and, I, and suddenly there was this levity for me when I realized like, well, wait a second. Um, I have an undergraduate degree and then later a master's and a PhD. You know, I could probably get a job at like um, a fast food restaurant, like, and I could get minimum wage. And I could live in like a modest apartment somewhere in a not fashionable place. And on the evenings and weekends, I can make my weird art and no one can stop me from doing that. Mm -hmm. And that is a life that's worth living. And that is like a really cool thing to do. And, and then I thought, well, you know, I have a PhD, so like maybe I could make manager one day of Taco Bell. And, and this is not to malign Taco Bell. By Taco Bell, didn't I didn't quite mean, make it, but you got on the faculty at Stanford, so. <laughs> okay, so eventually I, like, I'm at the top of a pyramid scheme now. Um, that's another story. But, like, but, at, but at, the point is at that, at that moment where I was devoting myself, it actually was not a difficult thing to do. It was a moment of joy and levity because I had this so-called Taco Bell pen, which, by the way, includes, like, working at a car wash or at like a photocopy store or something. It's not, it doesn't have to be fast food preparation. And it's not to malign the many people who do those jobs and I'm grateful for them to do those jobs. It's just that like there was a sense that my education in theory, most people would say as a common sense thing over qualifies me for that or not over actually in many sense, in more real senses under qualifies me. But the point is I had like all this education and this experience and the skill in this certain thing that society was not going to compensate me for. And that was okay. It sounds like a lot like uh, Charles Ives. You know, the Ives, and it's, I mean, I didn't think about it at the time, but yeah, certainly the idea that you have a day job. Um, and of course, Ives was a rock star in the insurance business. I mean, he literally wrote the book that was in use for decades um, after him. So, I mean, that, that the code or whatever that he wrote. So that's pretty cool when you have a day job and you're that good at that other thing and, mm -hmm. you, and you don't have to make french fries or something but the the um but for me it was like the idea of like okay i can mow people's lawns and i can survive and that's a life that's worth living and i also realized like i'm an atheist and so like people devoted to religion don't make sense to me but i realized people who have like a monastic life like monks or nuns with this new found realization i recognized that um they weren't the, the new found realization that i could devote myself to doing this thing that was really important to me and I might not drive a fancy car and I might not live in a nice house and I might not get to take plush you know like luxury vacations and that was okay for me and it but it wasn't a um it wasn't a um what's the word when you give up something it wasn't ascetic it wasn't like some sort of thing where I was giving up something and so I suddenly realized again I'm not religious so I don't share this sort of spiritual outlook but I recognize that monks and nuns and people of that sort are actually not giving up something they're getting something they're getting a kind of liberation of sorts because they they can actually do this thing that um that means something to them and so um, i had this weird kind of understanding in a strange way of of that whole sector of um mm -hmm. of, of, a, of a kind of a how to live one's life i'm sorry i'm a, I'm a little bit digressing but your point really was was to ask the question about if there was a turning point or a moment. Mm. And, and that was the moment where I just sort of like that, and then November 1st, 1987, in Copenhagen, when I saw Miles Davis, and um, that was just, that, that experience just blew me away. And so that, coupled with the Taco Bell plan, propelled me forward and galvanized my dedication to, um, to doing what I do. And I've really never looked back, and it's been, it's been a great ride, and then and then along the way, some nice things happened that allowed me to buy uh, to go on a luxury vacation and buy a house and drive a nice car. And you know, I do work at Stanford now, and that's been really great. And I'm I'm del I'm happy for that outcome. But I wasn't expecting it, and I never felt entitled to it. You know, I can really appreciate the thing you said about atheism and finding 
the 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 void that other people have already filled and finding it your yourself i mean at least that's, that's kind of what i took from what you were saying but i experienced the same thing growing up in utah uh, my parents and and my whole family were not churchgoers and every sunday none of our childhood friends were available and there was always this extra space to fill but i think i i, I did that myself with percussion and performance and composition it was just yeah like finding this life purpose and uh it's, it's really cool you said that like and laurel knows i talk about this stuff all the time um and it's very relatable yeah it kind of it reminded me of um my topic a few weeks ago with the study of genes and and music and they've actually yeah. found two genes that work kind of reciprocally and the one that's connected to making music and experiencing um you know auditory structures is actually totally linked to the gene for spiritual experience right um yeah. or you know great meaningful experience if you will so yeah what people call cool. spiritual experience yeah, yeah. Okay. um Hey, well, you know, Mark, we were talking about uh, your percussion works and, and how your percussion works are just really, really popular. As a, as a composition teacher, I, w I, was, I just thought it would be great to ask you, what percussion works do you show students to exemplify good percussion writing? Are there certain go-to composers you have or, or certain composers you like to avoid or, or uh, anything like that? Um. I mean, there's kind of classics, you know, that I think are, are useful for different reasons. If I had to name one piece, it would be ionization. Um, and then there are other pieces that are that are interesting for multi for, for many reasons, like like Zyklus is interesting um, in a number of different ways. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, it's hard to name. It, but here's the thing, though. I think that a lot of um, there's like there's this notion of idiomatic writing that composers have and we, um, we aspire to and suffer from, if you know what I mean. So, it, which is to say that um, it's like you praise um, writing something in an idiom, but at the same time, if you're, if you're like me and like many of my students that I see, we, we get tired of idioms and the whole idea is to push on the boundaries of those idioms. And so you have to make new territories and stuff. And that sometimes manifests itself in found percussion instruments. And sometimes it manifests itself in ex quote extended techniques. But with percussion, more than any other kind of uh, instru instrumental area, I feel like um, the, 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 the concept of pushing on idiom was already so firmly established culturally that it doesn't make sense to think only to think of percussion idiomatically. So to think about pieces as exemplars of like idiomatic writing in percussion, I mean it's it's it seems I'm not I'm not dissing it, but I think its utility is limited in some ways. I think I think the as, as soon as you're writing for percussion, you're almost thinking um, extra idiomatically or trans idiomatically or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, I think that there's a lot of music to look at that is not percussion music that can help you write percussion music. I would even say there's a lot of, a lot of non-music to look at that might help you write percussion music, things that are extra musical. Yeah. I've, kind of, I've kind of evaded that, but I, you know, in some ways, because I don't want to get into a list of like my favorite pieces or anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's just a, it comes down to a Stevens versus Burton grip uh, death match that's really yeah, that's, yeah. Really that's good I, you know that's the whole point of the podcast really is, <laughs> I thought so. yeah yeah really so we're just trying to, to that, really. yeah we're just trying to push our agendas on people really yeah. it's that's yeah. right. it's it's great so, to hear you you talk about that though because i i know a frustration i have is the second one of our you know the second a real composer writes something everyone just just huddles on it and just like doggy piles it and all of a sudden you have juniors at community colleges playing re Zanakis pieces and uh, the, the rep I feel like the good rep quickly gets kind of diminished because so many people so, play it maybe before bad, they should so you're saying it's a bad thing when it becomes um, when it becomes played by a lot of people um I, I think it can be I think I think it um, I feel like peop we're so hungry for rep that um, we're willing to um, 
we're willing to see past um, players' capabilities because we just want to play something well written by a historical composer so bad that you end up with things like someone who learns Anakis's Safa in like a week or something, and it's like you know, it's just. It, Anyway, it's Steve Schick who said you should take, you know, take a year to learn that piece if you need to. It's a really, um, a, a really heavy piece of music. And I, I feel like, you know, speaking of Fernie Howe, it used to be, man, if you could play Bone Alphabet, yeah, you, you've got yourself a career <laughs> on your hands. But, but now, yeah, you see a young people play it who I, I just, I don't know if they're ready for it. Um, so, no, I guess that's what I mean. It doesn't actually diminish the work, but to see these kind of... Um, you know, I guess seeing enough bad performances of it, um, yeah, I guess might diminish the work. Now, you, okay, so you, you've introduced the concept of a bad performance, and I'm, th on that, I'm with you. I think that it's, um, it's no good to give poor performances, but I also think that there's a separate problem. So I, I don't think it's a bad thing to have a lot of performances of something, and it's, and it's sort of like, who are we to say that you shouldn't be playing that you shouldn't interface with this. Um, but there is something culturally trivializing that maybe happens where if, it, if a piece becomes like oversaturated, then I think we do listen to it in a different way that is not only, that I think has, its presence um, is in a sense a good thing, but its oversaturation maybe is a trivializing thing. I, I, I think we're in agreement, yeah. And that's um, all changing, I feel like, with media, too, because, you know, whereas the presence is more visible to more people, you know, I think that we're seeing so many more of these maybe subpar performances because it's just coming at us online, you know, whereas before that could have only happened in person. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. one, one piece or cycle of pieces, I should say, that always comes to mind with this discussion for me is the Carter eight pieces for timpani. Right. Um, and everyone performs them so often. And I could sit in a recital hall and listen to good performances of it all day long. And I'm surprised that I have so many peers. I feel like the, the second they see, you know, canaries on the program, they kind of scoff at it. And it's like, no, if it's a great performance, I really want to hear it. Um, so I, I do think there's something to be said for if there's a piece as good as canaries is, for example, perform it all day long, as long as it's great, you know? Yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. Hey, hey, Mark, I'm, I'm curious, um, wh what do you tell your students regarding publishing? And should you try to be self-published? Should you even bother with publishing, um, uh, m making a living that way? I don't tell them anything because I don't know anything. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a publishing deal. And that started as um, from the fact that, like, um, I, 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 I mean, you're not born with a publishing deal. So, I mean, this is something that sounds stupid, but like I started without a publishing deal. Um, and then, and I mean, nobody offered me one, so there was nothing to consider. And then later it became a thing where I started to see some value in not having a publisher. It just seemed like I wasn't quite sure how that would really help me. So I don't have, I don't have strong, I don't have a strong uh, sensibility about it. But um, there's, there's a, I mean, in academia, if you're like having to do things like get tenure and there are certain kinds of status prestige things, there's like different portals that you have to go through. And if you go through enough of them, then, they just, then some people feel comfortable with the idea that they're conferring tenure on you. And so having like an impressive publisher used to be one of those things. And I'm thinking that that may be going away. I don't know if that's like an important thing. Evidently it wasn't for me or somebody just completely fucked up at Stanford and they gave me tenure without having a publisher. I don't know. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure that was it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Great. So you mentioned um, extra musical influences or um, kind of inspirations, Mark, does yeah. um, just considering the nature of some of your works that get performed a lot by percussionists, are any of those pieces theatrical pieces where they're kind of post-dramatic or more traditional drama? Uh, you know, uh, of my pieces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's increasingly um, a kind of a vector of inquiry in my work, which is so things that one could call th um, theatrical, or kinetic, 
or um, um, corporeal with like kind of a deliberate kind of um, corporeal sort of um, component. Um, in short, visual. I mean, all music is visual on the one hand, one could argue, and the intrinsic uh, activities on stage of a percussionist, and of course, you know, Parch was very well aware of this, um, is more entertaining for most people than, say, like the, the actions of, say, a, a piccolo player, um, which are very much there and very present and very important, but just um, on a smaller scale. And so they, it just doesn't track as, as being um, as meaningful in that corporeal space, I think, for most people. Um, and if you amplify that, you can start to think of that as theater. And I think a piece like Echolalia is an example of a piece that is um, deliberate in, as a kind of you know, music theater situation. Um, a lot, a lot. So, so anyway, I guess what I should say is that um, some of the pieces have these um, theatric visual elements that are the consequence of conventional musical praxis. Some of them are the consequence of a kind of heightened, sort of like uber musical praxis that's been um, expanded, not quite parodic, but have been like augmented in order to. Um, it, to create a, uh, an analogous augmented sort of theater of music. And then some things are conventions of music or conventions of theater that are then imported into music. And a lot of this stuff is, um, is whimsical and has a certain kind of levity and often a sort of absurdity. Usually I don't think in terms of comedy, like I don't think of it as being comedic, but I do think of it as being absurd and the absurdity i'm sort of like digressing i suppose but absurdity to me splits into a side that is um ha has a fun and joyful whimsical side and a very painful um side of the human condition and both are invited and i think that there's a lot of composers who shy away from those kinds of qualities but they're part of the human experience, and so I, I embrace them. Not in all of my pieces, but in many of them. Obviously, the choreography that one sees first in the isopangram movement of straitjacket, the second movement of straitjacket, and then in aphasia, and now in some seven pieces or so total, um, uh, that you sign this, this like nonsense sign language that I've been developing, those are some of the most um, luminous examples of that sort of pursuit. I don't think I answered your question. I may have answered a question you didn't ask. <laughs> but it's good. It's a good answer, though. It was um, good stuff, nonetheless. Yeah. 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 I am. Um, my topic for this week is very much uh, kind of discussing post-traumatic theater and performance art. And it seems like a lot of pieces, not just yours, Mark, but others as well. And I know Ben's going to talk about one. They, yeah, they kind of fall in the balance of those things. And um, uh, sometimes it, it's really, really lovely. Like I particularly really like the fourth movement of Straight Jacket, where the people are just, you know, drawing on the notepads. It says something to me about the, I don't know, it's a very common owl, a common thing. Everybody can draw shapes, and um, but there's some type of analogy there to like a life path, and everybody's on the same, but they connect, and um, I think that's really beautiful to me. That's a, a really successful. Um, okay. If I could just interrupt and correct no Laurel, this. because Laurel said everyone can draw shapes, and I did that movement at FAU, and we practiced it on whiteboards <laughs> to uh, you know, so we didn't keep wasting paper. And so, especially some of the earlier whiteboard drawings <laughs> were, were not, not very good. <laughs> you would think, you know, a circle or a triangle wouldn't be that hard to do, but apparently it can be. <laughs> it's, decept it's, it's deceptively challenging. And I think that there's two points here. One is that drawing on a, on a, on a piece of paper, basic shapes, is a quotidian, prosaic, everyday kind of activity. And Laurel's right then. And, and one could could attend to that and, try and get better at it. And then, but the other side of it is that quotidian activities under the um, sort of catalytic pressure of a performance suddenly can become 
um, you know, deceivingly challenging. I mean, it can become like a devilishly hard thing to do. And then suddenly, so the point is, and I'm making this, I've made this mistake many times as a composer, things that I think of as being an easy thing are not necessarily easy for everyone. Uh, one example of that is, you know, I built, I've been building sound sculptures since 1990 uh, made of junk and hardware and found objects mounted on electro acoustic soundboards. And these are played with chopsticks and violin bows and knitting needles and wind up toys and plectra and so forth. And I made some simple versions of these for the Paul Drescher Ensemble for performance of a, of a piece way back in 1995 called Shipio Wakes Up. And the players who are themselves some percussionists and some of them uh, in that case, a bassoonist and a guitarist and so forth. So they're, they're asked to play simple things like a spring or a doorstop or a series of, you know, threaded rods. And you'd be surprised how hard it is to get somebody to play a doorstop just right. You, you, you think that it's, it's, um, it, it's just sort of common sense, but there is actually a performance technique for that. And, um, yeah. So it can be difficult. But going back to this theater thing, I'll just say one more thing about it, which is that, again, all music is theater on the one hand. We could, we could say that. But I do think that I, as a composer, so here's something that I think about whenever I write a piece of music. I imagine some sort of space, some nominal space where this, the piece is going to be presented. And I imagine myself as an audience member. And that audience member is sometimes me, and it's sometimes other people who uh, in an unreasonable way, I wish to satisfy or fascinate. Okay, that's a different issue. But the point is, I'm, I'm, I have my, I'm a, I have this imagination of sitting in the audience, and then like, this spectacle begins, and the spectacle begins with people like entering the performers usually entering the stage. To me, that's like, it's not part of the piece as an artifact. It's not like a part of the piece that's in the bound copy that the Stanford library, music library collects, but it's like part of the experience. And, and of course, like, you know, somebody like, like there's that book called Musicking that, um, that describes this in greater detail, but like there's a, there's a large surround for the whole spectacle that is music. And I, I become interested in all that. So a piece like Rabbit Hole that Steve Schick commissioned, um, he conducted and commissioned for the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players, is a piece where players are constantly picking up instruments and mallets and beaters and different things, violins, getting their bows ready, putting mutes into trumpets and things like that, and they don't actually play. It's like all very, very carefully, it's all, there's musical counterpoint, there's very fussy, fastidious rhythms, it takes place in time. There's not a lot, there's not sound, but it's all the ancillary parts of music that have been turned into the material. So the pitch and rhythm in some respects are the last things to consider. And the first thing that I considered were page turns. So this is a drama that's about the page turns. So it all got set up based on page turns first, then mallet changes, then mute changes, then when you need to rosin your bow, all these kinds of things. And that becomes the musical material. So that's a piece that actually points out, in a sense, explicitly the theater and the drama that is intrinsic to musical performance mm -hmm. practice. Looking into some of the differences between maybe post-dramatic theater, which is, of course, uh, conceived of and meant to be a piece of theater, not necessarily a piece of music. And that differs from traditional theater in that the hierarchy of playwright, director, actor starts to diminish. Uh, it starts to go away and everyone involved in the theatrical process has a say in what this piece is. And it's interesting, Mark, that you talk about imagining when you sit down to write a piece, the, you walk in and then there's this entire spectacle and the space and the time, all of that is considered. Um, that's a very theatrical thing. and and. I studied theater in undergrad, and it's very much talked about. To quote from the book called Post Dramatic Theater by a German theater critic names, named uh, Hans Lehmann, uh, it's of course been translated into English. And just to warn everybody out there, it's pretty dense. It's like a dissertation that has been translated from another language. 
Um, so it, it took a little while to get through, but some of it is so eloquently phrased, even in translation, that I just want to read a few quotes here. Uh, in principle, performers in theater want to transform not themselves, but a situation and perhaps the audience. Uh, even in theatrical work oriented towards presence, the transformation and effect of catharsis remains virtual, voluntary, and in the future. But by contrast, the ideal of performance art is a process and moment that's real, emotionally compulsory, and happening in the here and now. And I think in many ways, a lot of works written for percussionists that are not traditionally idiomatic to percussion at all fit into this category of performance art. And, and we've named some already, like aphasia, not, yeah. not for a percussionist, but we seem to all do it. Uh, Terry DeMay's Silence Must Be is for solo conductor. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see any conductor do that. It's like only percussionists playing that piece. Um, so, you know, yeah. in 1994, I wrote a piece called Tulin, which is for three conductors and no players. Yeah. And, and, and Steve Schick conducted the premiere of that. And that's an interesting thing in that particular case because it's an insult to conduct. I can't find, I've never found card carrying professional conductors who are interested in this piece right. because their whole idea is that the very function of conducting is to elicit a sound. And so, and, and they, and they presumably think that this is just making light of, you know, of their elaborate training and dedication to this craft. So it turns out that again, it's like composers, percussionists, those folks are the ones who ended up conducting that piece. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not too uh, surprising. <laughs> really. um, what's, uh, what's cool to me and what I've always thought, even before reading this book, is that some of these more experimental musical works have been explored somewhat in terms of concept and audience experience through theater already. Um, mm -hmm. And just to kind of further uh, reiterate that point, I found a really great excerpt by the playwright and director book Bertolt Brecht, who was born in the late 19th century, lived through both World Wars and the Cold War. Uh, he's German, but he lived in many different places. He coined the term epic theater, which, uh, and get this, sought not only to inspire empathy in an audience through the telling of a story, as is very traditional in the theater, but to inspire action and social change through critical reflection. Uh, and very cool. So here's what he says, and this is back, you know, 70, 80 years ago. The modern spectator does not wish to be patronized and violated, namely through all kinds of emotional states, but he rather wants to be presented simply with human material in order to arrange it himself. This is why he also loves to see the human being in situations that are not self-explanatory. And this is why he needs neither the logical justifications nor the psychological motivations of the old theater. The relations of people in our time are not clear cut. Therefore, the theater has to find a form of representing this lack of clarity in as classical a form as possible. Oh, yeah, and it's so, I know that's a lot to take in all at once. Uh, you guys think... all said, hmm, like you get it. I don't get it. <laughs> I know. But I'm, I'm very, I'm very impressed with all of you. All the other, all the doctors get it. Well, I don't get it. I know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's like really, be you know, this is such a long time ago. And he's, he's, he's pointing out that these traditional things, they're, they're becoming too, they're just too normal for how people interact even then. And so you consider now our interactions are completely different. They are incredibly digital. They are incredibly not person to person. Um, and yet we will still go to see live works of art. And so how does the art have to have to change? And um, just to bring back to certain things you said, Mark, about the absurd, um, that to me demands that the audience arrange these events in their own mind themselves. And you have to figure out not only what is being presented to you, but how do you interpret 
what it means, especially when it's not self-explanatory to borrow some of Breck's uh, terminology. Um, well, you know, Mar I feel like Mark's pieces are perfect for that, too, because part of your sign language integrates these little gestures that we are familiar with, but in a nonsensical way, uh, like, like, like this, it's like, wait, peace sign and crazy, it's like it equals, it's like, I know what each one of those mean, but in this context, it's kind of this absurd, wild thing. Yeah, I think it can be a fine line when you decide to take away logic in, you know, whatever kind of work it is. Um, but when it is done really well, it's, I think it's incredibly powerful and very provocative uh, in terms of a, a critical response from the audience and perhaps, you know, a change in their listening habits or their performance habits and um, things like that. I'm trying to see if there's anything else that I really wanted to. Well, Laurel, you, you often talk about, you see, you know, th these pieces we call performance art pieces or percussion theater pieces. Mm -hmm. And with, with your, th your theater background comes out in that you get annoyed how people can't seem to act when they're called to. <laughs> like, uh, uh, we, we played the stick umbrella piece, and I feel like we did a great job, and it was partly because you were a good actor, and I'm not a good actor, but I didn't try to do more than I could. It's like, okay, I can only act these couple of things. I'm not an actor. I'll just do my best with that. Um, so. Yeah, I do find it. I think I get um, kind of unreasonably bothered by that. I probably need to see a psychologist or something about it. Because, um, I get incredibly bothered when a piece of music demands a bit of acting from its players and the players seem to think that, you know, just representing whatever action you're doing is something that is legitimate in the realm of trying to express this piece or um, trying to show some sort of self-transformation to borrow a term from post-traumatic theater. And there, there are some pieces that require that, like for example, not to toot my own horn, toot toot, but um, that piece that stars, I play- Stars, Cars, Bars. Yeah, Stars, Cars, Bars. Yeah, that's what I was thinking um, of, yeah. Yeah, it's a really wacky piece. So for anybody out there, it's by Adam Silverman, and it's marimba and then spoken player, uh, spoken text on top of it, written in rhythmic fashion. So it's it's very organized in terms of the the music and uh, the text, and it's based off of Nabokov's novel Lolita, um, which if you don't know, you should go look at, but it's very disturbing. You should just know that. And he, he wrote it for uh, a guy to perform. And you're supposed to say the words of this song that come from uh, the older male character in the book in a way trying to seduce and entice the young Lolita to come near him. And so he's written it in terms of- The light of my life, fire of my loins, my sin, my soul, <laughs> my Lolita. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Mark Albemarle. <laughs> Dr. Mark Albemarle. That's all um, I remember. And so there's a, you know, undoubtedly there was a particular kind of intent in terms of writing that for a man to perform and play the marimba, but I was the first woman to do it and, you know, chose to perform it in such a way as if, like, you represent Lolita and her experience of realizing what was being done to her. And so throughout the piece, it's not so much of here is my character and now I'm happy and now I'm sad, but it's um, a self transformation on the stage through the piece. And mm -hmm. so it becomes very visceral and difficult to perform. And I think really difficult to watch in a way because oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's like really troubling. Um, well, I think it goes back to what we were saying before of just a good performance, bad performance, you know, you know how to act. And yeah, sometimes I, I wish we saw that more in other pieces. But also kind of uh, what you said, Laurel, of, you know, not having, there not being any training in the curriculum or, or, or performers seeking out any training or help or spending as much time on it. It's kind of this similar idea to, you know, you can learn all these notes in this piece, but what are you saying with it? How, you know, what is your sound production? You know, all of these extra things that are 
more than the black and white notes on the page. So you're probably extra sensitive to it since you do have training experience in it, you know, in the same way that we are to sounds. Well, I always get, I always, I always wish as a teacher, I had more tools to, to, to get players to, you know, get their personality to come out a bit. You know, I feel like they're, they're so hung up on just trying to get it, just trying to get it right, trying to imitate what the last person did. I think we, mm -hmm. we've said this before, but it's that craftsman versus artist thing that John Wayne wrote about that uh, we, we've said now and again. But, um, yeah, I just I, I wish I could start that sooner with them. You know, like, I, I need to get you out here. I need you to perform. Don't just play, perform. Right, and what's interesting to – sorry, I get really rambly when it's about theater stuff. Um as opposed to every other episode of the podcast, but you're rambling. That's what that's what you're saying. Huh? Nothing. Nothing. Please, sorry. No what? Oh, no. I was just going to say that um, my experience as someone who just liked theater and just wanted to take an acting class for fun, it made me a more expressive musician because uh, in acting classes you take away that extra element of a another language that you're trying to read and communicate in, and you also take away the instrument, and you're dealing with just yourself. Um, and at least the, the training I went through, it began, you didn't, you weren't given a script. We weren't given scripts until like the last half of that first semester, because it was all about exploring the body, exploring what your voice does, exploring what's inside of you before you even consider um, applying that to the words of someone else. And, you know, I, even at that time, I started to draw these parallels between, like, perhaps this is improvisation. Why are we not beginning with improvisation, like free improvisation that we then try to, you know, form into clear expression through other people's words, if you will. You know, I was, that reminds me, I was talking to somebody recently about the analogy of being a method actor um, to composing pieces. We were, we were, there was another composer, a student of mine, and we were both talking about how we spend a long time thinking and making all sorts of sketches and jotting down notes and ideas and considering a kind of a constellation of forces and the rules, the laws of the universe that comprise this piece to be written. And then when it comes time to write the piece, what most people would think of as writing the piece, um, of putting like down notes and rhythms and you know, little dots on pieces of paper, that can be very, very fast as this sort of le last phase. And it, but in fact, the composition started months or sometimes years before with all of these notes and things. And it's a little bit like the time that a method actor spends getting into his or her role. And then once, if that's done satisfactorily, he or she can do anything, can follow the script or not. I mean, there's different kind of formulations, I presume, or different conventions with that. But you, um, you're in, you're, you're in character. So for me, it's like getting ready to write a piece is like learning what the universe that this piece is about and, that, and, and knowing that universe. And then you can just operate in it and you can do it very fluently and very mm -hmm. flexibly. And there's a little bit of that kind of like pulling the elastic band back is that process and then letting go of it is just is composing this piece. And I think that improvisation is a similar way. You are getting into character and if it's like most improvisation, then it, that character is you. You're actually trying to improvise. You're trying to, it's like a self-realization sort of thing. And then you go and then you just do that stuff in the character that is hopefully the best, most musical you at that moment. You know, since y'all mentioned it, uh, Caleb Pickering uh, asked via Facebook uh, for Mark. He says, as a very creative and skilled improv improv improviser, excuse me, uh, do you think we should teach young college students enough uh, improvisation, jazz, and or free, what changes would you like to see in the education curriculum to help students develop uh, improvisation skills and their own personas? I'm a big proponent of improvisation. I'm a proponent of improvisation for people who call themselves improvisers. I'm a proponent of improvisation for performers who want to perform music that is, let's say, more or less determinate music of um, non-improvising idioms. I'm a proponent of improvisation for composers who, who distinguish their, their process as being distinct from improvisation. I think improvisation can play a role for, for everybody. And I think it's important and I think it belongs in the college curriculum. That said, I would say to Caleb that 
the time to learn improvisation is long, it, it, by college is too late. It, the time to be thinking about improvising is much earlier. And I'm not, I, I think it's interesting to improvise in a style system, in an idiom. So like learning how to play 12 bar blues is a good thing. Learning, how, in other words, to signify, right? So like, I was, well, let me finish that thought. Learning how to play 12 bar blues or learning how to play like different cadenzas to a Mozart concerto or whatever, just making up your own. This is, this, this is a good thing. Of course, organ, Derek Bailey in his book, Improvisation, makes the point that um, organ players are kind of the last bastion of the kind of Western European tradition where it's expected that you might still improvise. Um, but anyway, that used to be a standard part of, of life. And so the idea that you would then um, have to, it's, uh, well, let me finish this thought. So you have this, again, there's this like Eurocentric notion um, that invention in forms is the be all and end all of like creative um, expression. Whereas there's a kind of Afrocentric idea and I'm recklessly and hopelessly distilling uh, a continent of you know thousands of peoples and languages and cultures into one idea but then again we once had a president who thought who did say that africa was a big country um in any case right. the, the, <laughs> but there was this kind of afro afrocentric notion that like signification is where the um um is where the expressive locus can be and that you do that by creating your own statement often embellishments, ornaments, and other intrinsic invented, invented things on a, and adopted on an extant form. And that provided kind of community continuity, as well as a way of doing individual personalizations. And this is considered in this culture, um, which is now no longer merely, uh, or no, I shouldn't say merely, but no longer uh, limited to an African or an Afrocentric um, or an African American community, but this would be a, a, an act of, of remarkable, noble, and important creativity. Um, in any case, uh, cr uh, the default that we do, everything that we do, is improvisation. This sentence that I'm speaking now is improvised. If you, as I've said to people, you, you can imagine like going to lunch with somebody and sitting down and catching up with them. You haven't seen them for a while, so you, you have this lunch appointment, and you meet them at the restaurant. And as you sit down, you say, I've taken the liberty of preparing a transcript of our conversation today. Here's your part. You speak these lines and I speak, I mean, this would be ridiculous. But we have conventions and then there's like ideas like, okay, I'm gonna speak, then you're gonna speak. We're gonna each speak maybe 50% of the time. If the, if the lunch goes an hour, that wouldn't be unusual. If it went one minute or one day, that would be a little bit unusual. But there's, you know, it's kind of, kind of topics the weather or how's your new job have you taken any trips recently there's they're kind of you know but but the actual words um and their ordering is is completely made up so this is a and how we walk down the street and if you watch infants as they navigate their world this is all improvisation and then it's like our musical traditions like remove that it like sucks that out for like a couple decades and then students get to college and then Caleb rightly asks like, should we try to like pack that back into their education? So anyway, I think that there's a lost moment where we should be improvising all along. Now, the fact that we do determinate things that are non-improvised things, this is a good thing. It's the rare exceptional thing in life that we do something the same way twice. This is actually, I think the odder thing to do, but, um, but there's virtue in it, and there's lots of great places to do that. And, you know, Beethoven got a little bit hung up about soloists improvising their own cadenzas, and so he writes them out, and he says, no, play this one. This is going to be a good solo. So, you know, I, I, I dig that, too. I understand that, that impulse. Um, but it's really a, I don't know, it really feels like a, um, a, a lost opportunity to, to have improvisation missing from... The, our, our, our musical citizen reason for so long. Do you think if it's, so if you run into a college student that it is really missing, do you think you should try to get it in for them? Or do you think you go like, well, this isn't just, this is unfortunately just something that they're not going to get to benefit from because it's too late. If they think of themselves as being like a complete 
musician and an open-minded person, then absolutely. If they're like, they just, if they want to take, you know, orchestral auditions, you know, maybe not. I don't know. It depends on what their, sure. what their outlook is. Um, yeah, I would, um, I would say that there's also our egos are involved. So there's an impediment, which is we've, con so here's what I've always said. If a, if a colleague of mine who is a, we'll call him or her a classical pianist, comes, stops by and says, Mark, you know, I know you play jazz piano. Can you show me some jazz piano? I'd really like to learn how to play some jazz piano. And I were to sit down with that person for a couple hours to work on that. If I have another colleague who is a classical flutist and says, I'd really like to learn some jazz piano. Can you sit down with me for a couple hours and do some jazz piano with me? I'm going to get farther with the flutist than the pianist at jazz piano. And the reason for that is the pianist has constructed an ego um, for him or herself that sort of says like, well, this is my instrument and I'm really good at it. And I do these very amazing, virtuoso, fussy, sensitive things. And my life is, you know, I identify who I am on the basis of doing this really, really well. There's this huge impediment to sort of unlearn or just be open to the idea that they're going to suck and they're going to they're going to fail and they're going to be flailing around and i find that to be a psychological impediment that the person who doesn't expect to be good at the instrument that's why i said the flute it's not about flute playing yeah it's yeah. about not piano. something else sure yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. percussionists are we do that all the time so maybe they also yeah maybe, we're always we're right constantly right on, yeah. learning and being challenged in that way exactly I'm glad you think I'm glad you think we're awesome. Um, hey Ben, do you want to present your piece? I think we just have enough time if you want to. Yeah. So because uh, we're talking about this sort of theater choreography idea, um, I wanted to speak in particular about a piece by Mauricio Coggle called Dressur, um, which we'll get to in a second. But first, just a little background on Coggle. Um, Mauricio Coggle was born December 24th, 1931, to a Jewish family in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, he studied composition in Cologne, Germany, and ended up residing there for uh, the rest of his life. Um, he was a member of the Darmstadt School of Composers that includes Boulez, Stockhausen, uh, Donatoni, Cage, Berio, and kind of a slew of others that we think of in that similar 20th century, very experimental vein. Um, generally, Coggle's works can be classified into three categories. So there are his quasi-serial kind of structured works. Um, there's instrumental theater and visual works, including film. Dressur is going to fall into the uh, instrumental theater works. Um, a few other uh, works by Coggle of interest to percussionists. Um, there's a piece by him called Concert Piece for Timpani, uh, or sorry, yeah, Concert Piece for Timpani and Orchestra. Um, and there's a clip of this that's kind of widely distributed around the internet, where at the end of the piece, the timpanist uh, kind of rams his mallets and his entire half of his body through a paper timpani head and goes down into the timpani. Um, and then he has a piece called Ur, which is uh, six duos for two percussionists. And he has a piece called Art Bruit for percussionist and assistant. And then one of my favorite videos, there's about a five minute clip of this on YouTube, uh, is called Two Man Orchestra. Um, which it's just, the stage is just littered with stuff, and it's just, it's complete nonsense. It's wonderful. Uh, one of my favorite parts of it is one of the percussionists holds a tambourine in his mouth and then plays like a basically a very long bass drum pedal that's swinging and hitting the tambourine in the face. It's great. <laughs> um, it's awesome. So uh, this, this kind of sounded a lot like what Mark was saying, um, but just to, to give Coggle's take on instrumental theater, um, Coggle says, music has also been a scenic event for a long time. In the 19th century, people still enjoyed music also with their eyes, with all their senses. Only with increasing dominance of mechanical reproduction of music through broadcasting and records was this reduced to the purely acoustic dimension. What I want is to bring the audience back to an enjoyment of music with all senses. That's why my music is a direct, exaggerated protest against the mechanical reproduction of music. My goal, a rehumanization of music making. Um, so Dressur definitely falls under that category. Um, Dressur is, uh, it's a half hour long theatrical piece, or I would call it 
more of a spectacle or a zoo even <laughs> um, for three percussionists. It's scored for all a variety of wooden instruments that just litter kind of the entire stage. Um, and it's part of a cycle of four pieces uh, composed in 1977, together known as Four Degrees. The title is actually in French. Um, it was premiered in Metz, France, by Le Circle in 1977. The members of that ensemble were Gaston Sylvester, uh, Jean-Pierre Drouet, and Willy Colliquat. Sorry about my French name for some pronunciation there. <laughs> Um, so, dressure translated into English is dressage, which is a type of kind of uh, horse training. It's almost like uh, synchronized swimming, but performed by horses on land. Um, and it's meant to be a uh, kind of a comparison or an allegory between uh, horse training and conservatory training of musicians. Um, so this piece begins with one of the performers playing a circus gallop on marimba, um, and one of the musicians, the musician on the left side of the stage from the audience perspective, is increasingly agitated with this person and starts banging on the floor with a chair and ends up kind of lifting the chair and chasing that person away from the marimba. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly kind of go through some of the events in this spectacle that is in Dressur, that is Dressur, in no particular order. Some of the spectacles are one of the performers rips off his shirt and starts playing his chest with coconuts, which the first time I saw this piece performed, I had no idea of what it was, and I saw a percussion group Cincinnati perform it, and when Alan Adi ripped his shirt off, and I was just mine was what is going on here. Um, at one point, one of the performers puts on wooden clogs on his hands and his feet, and uh, does a very kind of cute little dance. Um, one of the performers attacks someone playing marimba with bamboo wind chimes, I and mean, then kind of is sloshing the bamboo wind chimes all over the marimba. Um, and then uh, there's there's this fandango section, um, the part kind of with the wooden clogs that, that ends with all three performers shouting ole at the top of their lungs. Um, and the piece ends with the, the person who started uh, playing the circus gallop on marimba um, starts playing it and becomes increasingly frustrated and it starts accelerating to a tempo that just becomes unplayable and the player throws his or her sticks up and just kind of stomps off stage and then the other two players are on stage kind of quietly playing for a minute before the lights come down. Um, but it's a piece that, uh, I, it, it's funny because I know Mark talks a lot about experimental music. It's not supposed to necessarily work. The whole point is that you're doing this experiment to find out what does happen. And a scientist can't say this reaction won't work until they've you know, done the experiment. And Dressur is definitely an experimental piece in that sense. Um, and I've kind of, at some points in my life, I've just been, you know, mind blown, loved it, thought it was the most amazing things. Then other times I kind of get, I think Laurel's probably in this contingent, kind of get annoyed with it almost and with what it's trying to ask and get on with. But again, that to me doesn't really matter so much as the doing of this piece and the, the fact that it does exist. So well, that is uh, my take on Dressur. Well, you know, you know, speaking to sometimes liking it, sometimes not. I think there are certain pieces that only work once. Like you, you, once you once you get it, it, it sticks with you, and you really remember it. But to experience it again is is yeah, it's, it's not going to be as impactful. I, you know, I would love to ask Mark. Do do, do you think you know, in my limited knowledge of of music history and and twentieth century music, do do you think uh, um, you know Dada? this piece, Concerto for Florist, do you think that's kind of the, are, are you part of that progression, do you think, or, or, or do you think, because to me it seems like, yeah, that makes sense, and now this other guy wrote Concerto for Ping Pong Players. Yes, of course, of course Ping Pong Players would follow Florist, or, you know, how do you, how do you think that all works? I'm happy and flattered to be in any conversation or lineage that involves Dadaism and um, and dressure or anything or coggle, frankly. So um, anyway, I find that a flattering comparison. And I think that is part of, yeah, there's no question that's part of my musical DNA. My motivation is a little bit different than Coggle's. I His concerns about mechanical uh, music reproduction and in, in short, the human versus the mechanical dilemma that appears in so many ways in the 20th and now 21st century, I share some of those ideas, but my motivation for writing pieces like, like that have, bear a kinship to his sort of musical theater formulations 
are not motivated because of that. They are, however, motivated by this interest in, um, in the more Dadaist impulse and the sense of spectacle, some of the musical theater um, notions that Laurel brought up. Uh, but in any case, I mean, I'm, uh, there's very warm, mirthful feelings um, that I have. Um, and, and I, but here's one thing that's a little different. The dramatic, the thing about the exasperation of the percussionist who throws the mallet up in the air, or some percussionist who has to tack another percussionist. These are things that require very thespian, histrionic acting chops, and they require this kind of motivations and things. And this is stuff that Laurel, um, you know, referred to. The, this is something that I steer clear of um, for two reasons. First of all, I just I'm nervous that percussionists. Uh, or no, musicians aren't trained and don't have the chops to sufficiently pull that off convincingly. And so that it just ends up looking embarrassing sometimes. Um, yes, thank you for saying it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, I'm with it's you, just, dude. It's just embarrassing to watch people do some, I mean, not dress, I, I don't know, I have, a, I have a soft spot for dresser and other pieces, so I'm happy to see those. But th there's another thing which I really hate, which is the, th this is the worst part, and good musicians don't suffer from this, but many musicians do. And that is this kind of self-congratulatory mode of like, look, I'm doing something that's, quote, out of the box. And this is not what I studied with my teacher when we were doing rudiments. Um, I finally get to go crazy and tear my shirt off. That's not a flammadiddle. You know, so there's this, you know, that's, again... <laughs> You know, it's what like, have I been studying all these years then? <laughs> I'm very impressed by your, by your uh, lexicon of percussion. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, yeah, so you have this like endless sort of like Stevens versus Burton grip kinds of like fussiness and then you get to tear your shirt off and of course, comparatively, you'd rather tear your shirt off. So I can understand that, but then there's this, you could, the audience can just see how excited and, and um, that you are to do this, and that just looks sophomoric. It just it looks it, it looks incredibly juvenile. Like, look, we're doing something that's a little bit irreverent or risque. And um, if you look like you're, if you look, if I don't know, I don't know. There's just there's got to be like whole theories on like how to tell a joke. If you look like you're impressed that you have a joke, then the joke's just not funny. You know, there's yeah, certain. Yeah. Fun, I'm just much more, I'm much more a fan of this kind of deadpan thing. And so what my, the theater that I do is actually incredibly not subtle, but it's made more subtle by having people just do things plainly and, 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 and not try to um, invoke a persona mm -hmm. and, and certainly not try to like wink at the audience and say, isn't this cute that we're all together doing this funny thing. You just do these things. It's like you, you in the concerto for florist, Terry Longshore has to like mix um, a tray of martinis and serve them to the audience. And if he looks like he's having a good time doing that, it just looks really stupid. He just has to execute that the same way he's got to change mallets or make a page turn. And Brian McWhorter has to like hand out hot towels to the audience and stuff in the middle of the piece. And that's a musical specification. That's something that has to happen. And it just looks really tacky if he giggles, like, isn't this cute that I get to hand out hot towels? You just have to do these things in a very prosaic, deadpan way, the same way that you'd be changing your, your French horn mute or something. So, in, a, in, a, in a weird analogy, it, it actually reminds me a lot of uh, Bob Becker playing rags on the xylophone. Yeah. It's this novelty, you know, almost comedy type of music but he doesn't approach it that way. He takes it very seriously, and it's you know it's very deadpan, and it sounds you know cutesy, you could say, but it's very virtuosic in its its nature. It's not it's not for the kind of wink at the audience aspect right. of it. Now there are people who are just masterful virtuosi who have these interdisciplinary, intermedial chops. Steve Schick is somebody who like if you see his performance of like the Ur Sonata, this is like heavily invested in this kind of thes thespian kind of uh, comportment and it totally works. He played aphasia, he plays aphasia, and he does 
uh, some sort of facial gestures. And I found it a little bit shocking at first because I had a vision of how this piece was to be. But then I realized um, he, he owns it. It's like, I mean, I don't know, or, or actually, no, more importantly, I don't own my pieces. I mean, I'm, I've just, by the way, I've just wandered into a new topic. But this is actually an important one, which is like, I don't own my pieces. Who, who am I to say that Steve's interpretation of what I thought I was trying to do is less sensible than mine? I'm not sure. I mean, we have this notion of the, like the, the, the author and the, you know, the, the authority that's in the word author um, of, of, the, of the composer. But I'm not sure that the composer knows best. In fact, I've started, I've taken to putting a little statement at the beginning of all my scores that says, the composer thanks the performer in advance for making any and all changes that make him seem more intelligent and creative than he actually is, you know. So I like this idea of deputizing people to do this. And looping back to this, to this, this thing, I mean, it's quite possible that taking on a very histrionic affect might, might, what could, can work for some people, as it clearly does for Steve. And I just, I wanted to add one thing to the, the Coggle discussion. I think it's almost ironic, the fact that this piece was written as a protest to give an audio only music, but there are surprisingly for such a large involved work, a lot of very good recordings of this piece on YouTube. Uh, the one that comes to mind for me is the Yale Percussion Group, but there are yeah. certainly others. Um, and one thing that's really interesting to me about watching these different performances as you can tell, the score is notated so well and so clearly because all the performances seem very similar. And, it, you know, you could put, if it was audio only, you couldn't necessarily tell one from the other. Do you think, that's, do you think that some of these pieces, you know, I wonder if, I mean, Casey, you said something about how there are certain pieces that you really only need to see once. And um, I have the sense that I would like to I'd like to agree, but amend that a little bit, and say that there are pieces that have a first time impact, and um, that can never really be approached or replicated again the next time you see it. But which, but the best of which, even if they really do mark a point in time and they feel historic in some way, are still tell us something and are worth bringing out and revisiting even if it does seem to be like, have a, you know, a timestamp. In some ways, maybe the timestamp is the point, and maybe we can, we can celebrate that. And I think well, Dressur might be such a piece. I well, think and I the, certainly, you, you know, I think 433 is a great example. Um, so as, as, many, as much as I don't think I need to see 433 again, I also understand that other people need to have that first-time experience. So I, I feel like you know, with those those types of pieces where you, you can never get that effect that you did from the first time. Um, I'm, I'm actually, yeah. I'm so upset that Casey just put out the example of 433 because my example I was going to give, which I think is equally as good, uh, is Steve Reich has come out. Um, sure. And I literally, I had an argument with a friend that hadn't heard that piece and I ended up it was like I was literally like holding him down, forcing him to listen to it. But I mean, like, a, I mean, some of these pieces. The about, that, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I was going to say 433, which I think you're going to say too. The, the, yeah. con the concept of the piece is bigger than the piece itself, I feel. Um, it, just, just knowing about the idea of the piece is almost more important than just, it, it's a statement more than a piece, I suppose. Yeah, but you can also experience a piece like that in so many different spaces and on so many different systems, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like each of the experiencing it in these different ways is is like a new performance for me. You that's know? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That that four thirty three, I could actually listen to an infinite number of times, and mm -hmm. it's and it's and it's it's constantly relevant. That said, I am in agreement with mm -hmm. you that the polemical buzz or the kind of philosophical statement is a one off. You, you, you get the bang for your buck is the first time you, you experience it. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, hey. yeah, I do think that, um, like, for instance, since Ben was talking about Dressor, I saw the Yale Percussion Group video before I knew anything about uh, Coggle or his, 
intentions with that piece. Oh, and, you're so polite, Laurel. Um, yeah. Well, I, I'll say I, after watching the performance and then reading about the composer, it was very clear to me, like, oh, the problem's the performers. The composer knew what he was doing because he, like, involved in theater, writing radio plays and composing pieces, he knew what he was doing. Um, you know, and even if I have my opinions about the the particular parts, but um, yeah, the issue is, is in the performance. But you, and, you know, I. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh no, I was just kind of like now that I've seen a performance that I thought was maybe accurate but terrible, I don't know if I could ever go see it. Sure. You know what I mean? Like I don't know if I can cleanse myself of <laughs> that. Yeah, it's not fair. It's terrible. It's all right. I'm, you're I'm, a tough. You're I'm you're sure. you're part of the tough crowd. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, um, you know, uh, Brian Jeffs uh, has a has a question from Facebook for Mark. He says, as a composer, is there any difference in the satisfaction you may feel from a successful performance of a strictly notated piece versus an open-ended work like the beautiful metaphysics of notation? They are different things. First of all, this is a, it's an interesting question, and it's not a surprise that it comes from Brian Jess, who's a, a brilliant performer and composer, um, and and no surprise that he's a student of Terry Longshore. So that's um, there's a strong lineage there. Uh, Brian's so and Brian makes really interesting uh, pictographic scores too. So he's he's well versed in this. I would say that that, that these 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 um, enterprises have different. Uh, very different sets of values and very different um, uh, expectations in terms of their outcome. So for me, the satisfaction of hearing um, a determinate piece of mine well performed is the satisfaction of hearing realized in sound somatically some sound image that I imagined in advance. And then the satisfaction is hearing it, but it's equally, to be honest, the relief, if, if it succeeds, the relief of knowing that I actually correctly notated this sound image and that I had and that it could be translated to some interpreters who then realized it. So there's that kind of like idea from an author who then makes a musical no a notational specification whose purpose is to then give to a interpreter who's going to then realize and manifest in sound this, this image. That's a very, that's a appallingly boring notion about what music could be, but it's like the main one, turns out. Anyway, um, but that's, but, and I like to participate in that. I still do that. I still like to pre-imagine sound and then make an, a score and then have it perform. So that's one kind of thing, and I'm satisfied to, he, to finally get to hear this thing that I imagined. So that's the purpose of that. The other side, though, of like making indeterminate pieces and especially pictographic scores, that is all about n not imagining, and in fact, I would say sometimes avoiding imagining, uh, pre-imagining some sort of sound object, but rather creating a stimulant, a stimulus, an irritant to uh, a kind of a partner, uh, it's, we call them a performer interpreter, but they're really kind of a partner composer who are intrigued and who are the very small subset of performers for whom this is not an insult to their conservatory education where they're only interested in rendering determinate pieces, you know, tell me exactly what to do and I want to make sure that I have the satisfaction of knowing that I've excelled at it. So with that small cohort of performers who are interested in partnering in this compositional space, then I irritate them into doing something that I could not have imagined and the satisfaction there is being, I don't know, titillated and surprised and uh, overwhelmed and uh, at, at someone else's joyful interaction with it that has made this unexpected thing. So they're really, they're almost uncom uncomparable experiences, but, um, but equally important to me. Wow, wonderful. Hey, well, thanks so much to everyone else who asked questions. Uh, I think actually we covered your questions, but uh, another one from Caleb Pickering, uh, Ted Jackson, and Paul Millette uh, always thanks you guys for your, for your Facebook questions, and, and please keep them coming. 
Um, just a quick housekeeping item I wanted to let everyone know. Uh, we did get an answer back when we were talking about internships, uh, I don't know, four or five episodes ago uh, with uh, Jeff Mulvihill from Majestic. Uh, Megan was talking about internships and uh, so was so was Jeff and uh, Dave Gerhart posted on the YouTube comments a link to the Yamaha paid assistantship so there are more paid assistantships out there than uh, maybe we were able to quote and anyway please keep a lookout for more composers to come we're kind of on a composer kick this month we've had a a, a great streak uh, with the with Mark and coming up is um, uh, Alejandro Vignao and also Yuri Sio from Princeton University and man you guys thanks so much for your segments man Dr. Applebaum Mark Applebaum thank you so much for joining us this is this was really fun yeah. Thanks for having me. It was really, really great chatting with you guys. I'm sorry that there was so much chatting at you guys, but it was really a pleasure to be part of it. It was really great. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, anyway, have a, have a good one, everybody. Thanks again. So that might be the kind of thing. Well, I think